let's restart your brand. And I want to start with what I would love for you to get out of um, today is uh, I see COVID as a cracking business opportunity. And I think this is a great time to generate sales leads. And I want to inspire you with some case studies. Would anybody else like anything else out of this brand, resetting your brand? Are there any other issues that you would like me to cover today? Because I can gear it around that. Silence gives consent. So I think the reason why COVID is such a... Um, a cracking opportunity is in marketing it's all about change you've got to look at what has changed and I don't think there's if I hear the word unprecedented again I don't know about you all anyway but we are in very different times things have never been as they have been at this time lots of things have um, changed and with marketing we're always looking to disrupt disrupt patterns disrupt thinking disrupt attitudes and obviously actions with regards to what's bought but from my side of things it's the biggest disruptor we have ever seen in the market i've been doing this for 36 years um, i started off life at starches and i had my worst days business at the end of um, march when business just fell away i had clients ringing me up saying i know we have terms and conditions I know we have uh, periods of notice, but I just need you to know that uh, we are stopping paying you from today. It's like, right, okay, there we go. And uh, it was how we're gonna recover from that. But we did, and we said, right, okay, we've got to, to rock with this. And uh, we've deepened our relationships with our clients as a result. As one door shuts, another one slams in your face. That may be how you're feeling. But as one door shuts, another door really does open. And we've I've got countless examples to show you how people have pivoted, and another overused word, from the business that they've been into the business that they are uh, currently in post um, COVID. So um, once you've seen how things are changing, what does this mean? What does this mean to me? What is it going to make me do differently? I want you to think of that. And there's an economic term for this. It's called creative destruction. Has anybody ever heard of the term creative destruction? It means as businesses fall out of capitalism because this is what we're going through. An incredible storm at the moment is blowing through the economy and so many aren't resilient enough despite all the government handouts in um, £10,000 here and a furlough there. I know these sound like big numbers to some people, but those of us in business, we know there's a limit to how long those can keep a business going. You've really got to have some resilience in there to, um, to, to keep your head above the financial um, waters. Creative destruction, businesses will fall out, but new ones will arise and take their place because they will be fit for the current time. And that's what I want to talk um, about today. The vacuum that is left by those brands dying out. And it's sad, some of those brands will be missed, but they didn't have the critical mass of business to award them their license to operate this year, unfortunately, due to COVID. And I know it's harsh and the government recognized that at the start, didn't they? They said a lot of dreams will fall by the wayside this year. So talking about getting our dream machine going, this is about um, our remit. So I'm, I'm coming at this from a content marketing point of view. Content marketing governs your reputation, your business reputation. Your business reputation is everything you say, everything you do and everything others say about you. So it's a massively broad and complex subject. And that's why I've been doing it for 30, God knows, six years. And I've still not cracked it. I'm still learning every day. And it embraces some online performance, the social media side of things I'm pretty hot at as well. But where I really excel is in um, internal communications. So getting your team behind your brand. And when you promise your brand here, you deliver up here. Because if you deliver on the dot, people think, yeah, they did OK. But yeah, that's what they were supposed to do. God forbid you ever deliver down here, that gap is called disappointment. And if it's down here, it's called disgust. What you want is way up here if you can, but obviously you've got to find a profitable way to do that, to set a market offer that people want and then to deliver above because that gap is called delight. And that's what we want. Um, crisis management, when that has gone woof, down here and possibly into disaster, 
and that's where I come in. And I've got quite a few creds in this area, credentials. My credentials are when the country came to a halt in the 2001 fuel crisis, it was my client, p &O, Trans European was driving 70% of the fuel around the country at the time. So I can tell you how we did that if you're interested. Okay, so why word of mouth is key. No matter what your business, the mainstay, the easiest sales of your business is going to be from your reputation. I used Anne, she's good, she's kosher, she knows what she's, she's legit. You want to speak to Angela Podmore. She's a really good girl. Yeah, she knows. I know, 57 and still being called a girl. I don't mind. Uh, she's a really good person. She knows what she's doing, etc., etc. And now that's passing on to me. You work with Angela? Oh, yeah, yeah. You're a good show. Warren Buffett is one of my heroes talking of reputation. He says it takes years, years to build a reputation and you can wipe it away in five minutes. And that's when you think like that you think to do things differently and that's what he looks for in companies that he buys warren buffett if you're not already aware of him he was called the omaha oracle because he outrun the dow jones like the FTSE 100 is in the uk the dow jones yeah in the, the us he outrun the dow jones for 40 odd years because he and charlie munger uh had a formidable partnership and they looked for sustainable competitive advantage how do these people compete and um, is that something that anybody else could come in and get so how do you stand out does anybody have a lift pitch does anybody have if i was to get into an elevator now with you now and you could tell me this is your business and it's different to any other in the world you're very very brave soul but if you want to pipe up now is the time no. OK. So this is where Jack Welsh said he turned um, GE around. GE was General Electric. It was the biggest company in the world at that time. This is long before Apple and Alphabet. And he said, unless we can be number one or number two in our category, forget it. If we don't have a competitive edge, don't compete. You've got to know what you're. And this is the problem. There's so many terms for competitive edge your lift pitch, or if you're American, your elevator sell, or your customer value proposition, your unique selling point, or manner of other expressions that go to say what is your competitive edge. For the pu purposes of this, we'll just call it a competitive edge. Oh, drinks have arrived, thanks. For that. Right then, and then lastly on that front, and the, perhaps the most important one is the new guy on the block, who is uh, Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek. Has anybody seen Start With Why? No? Okay, there's a YouTube video that I recommend you look up and it's called Start With Why and it's a TED Talk. Simon Sinek is S for Sugar, I for India, M for Norman, E for Edward, K for Kite. Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Simon Sinek said, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And that's why we would love you to join our workshop and we'll help you catch your DNA. Anita and Joe have already been through this process, Lord help them, and they loved it. They were well ahead of the game because they put a lot of thought into their brand about the Hive and the IP centre and they whisked it off very quickly. It's very rare that that is done. Most people, and I've just been on one session first thing this morning, most people struggle with determining what their why is. And I'm going to share with you what the why is. The reason why Simon Sinek said people buy why you do things, not what you do. And he uses Apple as an example. Apple was all about think different. Don't be the same as Microsoft and everybody else following that herd. Be different, think differently. And that's when you have an iPhone or um, an airbook or um, air, uh, uh, an iPad, that is what you're doing. You are very much in line for um, getting to the intuitive side of my brain. The intuitive side of my brain is the limbic part of my brain. You know, if you believe as I do that we came out of the sea through evolution, that was the very primitive brain that, worked, that operates us. And that's what we decide. In a sales environment, it's the intuition, our gut, which isn't in our gut, it's in our nut, 
it's what helps us decide which one we're going to go for and we can't sometimes articulate it but it will come out later years later possibly or at least after a night's sleep as to why we did it anyway do look that up i'd re i'd highly recommend it start with why it's a ted talk by simon sinek 52 million views can't be wrong <laughs> no I, I don't follow the herd mentality but he has got 52 million views on that. I've been doing this for a lot longer than Simon Sinek. He was a Marine when I was doing this, but oh, I wish I'd done that video. Anyway, these are the three questions which I'm gonna, if you want to join up to our workshops and Anita, I think is gonna make quite a few available if you're um, up for them, um, is the DNA, which is um, why are we in business? Deceptively tricky little question. It sounds simple, it's not. What are we doing differently? That Jack Welsh one, unless you've got a competitive edge, don't compete. And then lastly, if you want to be a values driven business, you've got to be um, clear on what's important to you. That's all a value is. This is what's important um, to us. And I'm going to illustrate now with Kinetic. This is unique IP. You're not going to find this intellectual property anywhere else. This is out of my head about 15 years ago. And this is what I've developed. 20 years ago with the internet, brand changed. When I used to work for Cadbury's and ATS Tires, and as I say, p &O, but all manner of other big brands, they used to be able to send different messages to different people. That's gone, that's so gone, that went 20 years ago. These days, a brand has to be online of some sort, even if it's just a brochure on a website, in a website format, but you're open to inspection 24 seven. Even if you don't have a website, say you've just got a Facebook page, you're saying so much about your business with just a Facebook page rather than having a website. A website is your center of gravity. A Facebook page says, nah, I'm a sole trader. I only need a Facebook page. That brings me enough business, word of mouth feed. I'm not interested in growing anymore. So that's my theory. I'm not saying I'm right on all of this. Anyway, so our vision is, and I don't need to look at the screen to tell you this, is Every decent business deserves to be trusted. Now, what do we mean by that? A decent business performs to the triple bottom line. This is all the thought that goes into each one of these few words. The triple bottom line is you pay your people fairly, you treat them fairly. You also do as little harm to the environment as you make sustainable profits. And we would actively turn away some of these businesses that have taken some of this money from the government and they're putting it into new cars, not in our book, a decent business. Anyway, we believe if you're that, you deserve to be trusted. As I've already mentioned, in the public sector where they get money donated to them by us paying our taxes, they're risk averse because they know that they cannot afford to lose their reputation. In the business world, we're equally careful about our reputation because we understand that that's the source of our business from our customers that we've got to look after each and every customer to make sure the business continues to come through. It's the customers that award a business a license to operate every year. Our mission at Kinetic is we make a step change to your business. So you feel the pedal go onto the metal, as we say, when we get involved with standout content guaranteed. Now, standout content means that we're not just doing half a pound of content. We're doing a full load of content that makes you stand out. Much as there's this DNA in Kinetic's DNA, you need that same DNA to come out of you so that when you go out and you're saying something, you're saying something specific. You're not trying to be everything to everyone. You'll end up being nobody. You need to decide not, I want everybody to love me. Just who do you want to love you? What's the particular niche? What's your forte that you want people to, to love your business um, for? And the guaranteed thing is back in 2006, I set up Kinetic back in 2004, and we were okay, but we weren't awash with business. And one of the biggest um, obstacles was that people thought that PR people were long on talk and short on um, the, you know, the delivery, or I like to prefer to call it more bark than bite. Anyway, so that more bark than bite hit me because I'm, you know, CIPR, PRCA, been in it since Saatchi. For goodness sake, I'm a fully paid up member of the PR profession and we are not spin doctors. We are proper uh, profession, communication professionals. And um, I came into my team and said, 
I think we need to guarantee our results. And my co-director said, whoa, Ange, we cannot guarantee our results. Our results depend on our wits at getting editorial in publications. I said, yes, I'm not saying guarantee a particular publication. We can't say we'll get you the FT on a, a certain date, although I have worked with that woman. I'd say, but I think we could say that we would get you into a certain number of nationals or broadcast or we'd make some sort of stunt deliver so much interest and so the guarantee was born and we were the first to guarantee that back in 2006 guess what nobody else can say it the way that we can say it and our values although they're just words there there's words behind each one care we when a client asks us to jump we don't go oh how high because once you've spent that time and money you never get that time and money back rigorous we not only guarantee our results we perform to ISO 9001 2015 the most stringent service um, standard and we're looking to do more of that as we go through too as in to get more standards under our belt we're straight talking rather than brand bridges and other highfalutin language and then we're pioneering in that if it's not been done before let's do it our whole business is founded on that and also the last one is delight is threefold we aim to be delightful to work with to deliver clients delight from a delightful working environment for our team so it's no use them going and doing that for all of our clients and then coming back and weeping in the toilets at the office because it's such a miserable place to work so that's the DNA. So the, the clever bit of this DNA model is first off those three questions, which I hope you made a note of, why you're in business, what you do differently, how you do things your way and take a screen grab of that if you wish. But then how it comes out of you, how we amplify it. And most people start thinking, oh right, now I need spikes going off saying advertising or, public relations or um, I need a website and uh, digital and SEO and da da da. Forget all of that. It all needs to come together in concert. And the way to do it is to, to separate it through owned, earned and paid if you need to categorize them because there's so many different ways you can communicate. But think about, right, for this, the best way for our owned ones to, to maximize that because this is where you can control it the most. We need to get it on our website. We need to share it on social, backlink to a specialist landing page, perhaps on the, the website. We need to make sure our engineers, when they go out in the field, they've got a leaf, leaflet to leave behind that they can perhaps recommend a friend or just follow up on customer service. We need to telephone this, that, the other. those are all your owned um, communications. Your earned ones are things like obviously reviews, Google reviews, FIFO, Trustpilot, but also reviews such as, um, sorry, uh, editorial reviews where an editor chooses to give you the thumbs up that you are a brilliant company and that the way they give you that is in what we call a byline feature and we are the queens of landing the byline feature. We will go into um, a particular media outlet and say we have this DNA packaged in this way for the editor and they will cover it saying for instance Kim Cooper you're there on my first on my list by Kim Cooper saying this that and the other and of course with that you raise authority because Google looks at that media outlet and says that's no normal media outlet that is one that is highly trusted which they can tell from certain characteristics in its algorithm. So you'd think with all that very powerful earned stuff going on, as a PR woman, I wouldn't be interested in the paid for side, wouldn't you? Yes, she would. Why is she pushing to pay things? She gets it on her own wits. Why would she have to pay? And that's because every now and again, you'll have an absolute perler. Yankee, I can't see you, but Yankee, for instance, you might have a fantastic case study and Yankee, you might say, yeah, I want to get this out far and wide. And we secure editorial. It's all across your website and your social media. But then every now and again, you will want to give it a little paid for push. You will want to say out there, come on, let's make some more people aware of this. And that's where paid comes for. But what glues all this together? Messages. Your messages come out of your DNA and they are what you want people to think, 
feel and believe about you. So for Kinetic, we want people to know that we are so sure-footed in our campaigns, as you will see if you come to one of our workshops, that you will get a guaranteed result at the end of it because we've been doing this for years. We keep on uh, fine tuning what we call our bespoke sausage machine. We're churning out brands, but each one is a different recipe of um, meats or vegetables and seasonings. Okay, so right, how are you going to use this to generate a systematic flow of leads? These are the cogs that if I were you, I would focus on. So the first cog is first of all, say something. <laughs> Don't just stand there, say something, say something that stands out, yeah, say something that only you could say, that your specialist source, whatever it is that you do, like mine is helping SMEs communicate, I really help SMEs communicate and I know where they need to start, as for these cogs for instance, so I could talk about these in my sleep, in fact I often do. The point I'm making is that it's about your content has to stand out and really say something, that way you'll attract people towards you. We'll call those people leads because some of those people you think, why have I attracted them? I don't want to do business with them. That's what you call a CRM system. Don't get phased by three little letter uh, acronyms. A, a CRM system is purely a system that pulls together all those leads, collates them, organizes them, nurtures them into what we call prospects. Now prospects are what people that we do want to do business with but we're not even after them or customers, we are after advocates. We want people who are prepared to stand on an orange crate in the middle of a town centre and shout I love you Christina, you are the best thing since sliced bread. Those advocates are what we want because advocates are then going to be like a flywheel back into the content that builds trust. Advocates that we can stand up and say, yes, I love working with Christina. She's a fantastic actor, et cetera, et cetera. That's the difference that it makes. And then we need to get clear on who is our ideal customer. So our ideal customer, we don't just need to know them demographically these days. Oh, no, 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 that's not good enough. We've got to know them psychologically. So psychologically, we need to know their hopes, their dreams and their fears and their pains. What really wounds them? What, what upsets them? That's what we need to find out. So here's a few questions which I suggest you note these down because you might not come on the workshop and if you don't you need to know that you, this is how well you need to know your ideal prospect before you can start feeding that you need to know the answers to this and my screen's just gone oh goodness come on dearest one two three four five six seven eight there we go are we all back on? Yes, we are. So we need to know what sort of title are they or decision making responsibilities? And this is as relevant whether you're B2C or B2B. That means business to consumer or business to business, doesn't it? If it's business to consumer, you need to know the type of person. Is it relevant to gender? It used to be that women used to make a lot of the household decisions. Perhaps men make more of those decisions now. And there could, could be a market niche in there that you talk to a house husband because they are increasing, aren't they? But so many men feel as though they're neglected in that mass advertising side of things. You need to know whereabouts they are. Are you addressing the entire nation, the continent, farther afield, the world? You need to know uh, what drives them. This is the psychographic side of it. What do they want? What is worrying them? What keeps them awake at night? What are their future fears? What's their issues? What frustrates them? When do they get angsty? And those problems and pain points are so valuable because you need to find how you solve that. And that's the most important last question. How, how are you solving their problems? And you need to articulate that, not in long winded ways. You need to go back to your elevator pitch and hook them in. <laughs> hook them in with your one liner as to what makes you different, <laughs> pull them in so they're interested to hear another sentence. And then after that second sentence, <laughs> a third sentence and bit by bit, you get into 
engagement and engagement is a precursor to liking you and trusting you and then you need to know what format do they like it in do they like to read newspapers which is an older audience but plenty of younger people are reading them online or do they like video is it mostly social media is it youtube that they're they're after or is it facebook more so instagram these days snapchat WhatsApp, you can have a company page on WhatsApp now. So, you know, all that sort of thing. Which is the best format? Where do we see loads of these prospects that we know they are absolutely fine um, for us? But for all this theorizing, and that's what it is really, you've got to test these things. You've got to take loads of action. If there's one thing Tony Robbins or Anthony Robbins, as I like to call him, says, no matter what you decide to do and how steamed you might get emotionally to make things happen, you've got to make loads of action to, there's no, there's no substitute, is there? We all know that for the work ethic and the hard yards. And this is where I suggest, apart from these cogs and that persona, that's how these fit into these six steps. So the first priority in my mind to helping SMEs communicate so they get lots of sales leads is you need to get your DNA in place because that's the foundation for all your communications without that you don't know what you're saying or doing so I think that's well you do know what you're saying or doing but you, you're not focused in what you're saying or doing and that's what this workshop's about if you come to the workshop we will give you the proper lowdown on how to make that happen for you but you'll need to do your homework You'll need to watch that Simon Sinek 18 minute version video, please, which I'll, I'll send to you ahead to make sure you've got the right TED talk. But you need to think about that and you need to think about your business as to why you are here, and what makes you different and your values. But what's we, we will try and capture it in two hours for two people. I promise you that you will go away from it with some really um, good thoughts with regards to where you need to take it from. I can't guarantee at the end of the session that you will have your DNA, but I guarantee you that it will be a stimulating and possibly the best two hours of the year that you spent. And that's been a hell of a year to compete with. <clears throat> the best two hours of the year that you spent in a marketing workshop. It's a big talk, isn't it? Let's make sure I can follow through that my bark isn't worse than my bite. And then you need to build these pictures, these personas of who is your ideal customer, please. You need a really detailed target audience in mind. Don't get, make it a real person like Lorraine. Don't make it Lorraine Griffiths. Sorry to mention you, Lorraine, but you know, don't make, mention Lorraine Griffiths. Just you, but call her Lorraine and say, this is what Lorraine's like and go through each element of Lorraine. And you've probably got one of these customers already. <clears throat> the ideas of how you're emerging um, in, in terms of how your business is, is coming together is, is probably um, there in the background. And all we've got to do, it's like threads, we've just got to pull each thread together and weave it into a golden thread of your own. And it's not gold perhaps in colour, but it's golden in the sense of it will run through every piece of work that you do and it will be beautifully consistent and that's what people want they want beautifully a consistent approach um, from you and this persona will help you develop that because it will take your dna and it will say actually for this person this is how we solve their problem this is what they want to hear that will pull them into a video tutorial or a quiz or some sort of interactive presentation that they think oh, this is interesting okay and then you need to set some measurable objectives many years ago a guy called guinness you may have heard of this is associated with a part and he used to say this famous thing in advertising that i know 50 percent of my advertising spend is wasted the problem is I don't know which 50% and for so many years that held even well into the internet that held and still there are people out there that think you can't measure it you can that's the good news today you can and I'm going to share with you some of those dials 
the, re that's the dials, I call the dials, the dials are how you measure the performance of what you're doing. Now, the reason why you need to set measurable objectives is how do you know which dials you're going to look at? There's a load of dials. You're like in the cockpit of your plane of a brand. Which dials are you going to take notice of? Which dials do you need to, to notice um, most? That's where you need to set a measurable objective that says, OK, here we are in well, let's face it, it's January 2021 by the time we get around to doing much these days, isn't it? So January 2021, by the end of ooh, March 2021, I'm going to have acquired X customers, clients, followers, whatever. You set that objective and then from that will come first the need, then the reality how are we going to get those customers, followers, or um, whoever? So you need measurable objectives so you can measure how much return you got on your investment. And even if you don't spend a bean, if it's just getting followers, you know, you can do that for free. But you need to make sure that you're getting a return on investment for your time. Is everybody all right with this? Or does anybody want to pipe up at this moment saying, I can't hear you? <laughs> oh. Or you'd like me to slow down and say anything else? By all means, do. I sometimes don't take time for breath, do I? I'll take Thank time. Thank you, Ange. Um, no, sorry. Um, I think everybody, we've encouraged people to put their comments and questions in the chat. So if there's anything, we'll just stop you. <laughs> oh, um, but um, people seem to be all right so far. So, OK. okay. They're not dropping off by the, at the end of the <laughs> cliff, right? And set up. OK. And then um, your website, I want you to think of your website as your centre of gravity, the centre of gravity of all your communications, all roads should lead to the Rome that is your website. Your website is absolutely that engine that pulls everything together that should be immediately obvious. And the one I always cite is Steve Krug. Don't make me think. So many websites are so boring and laborious. They're written by people who love words. I love words, I got an A in English, but you know, it's not about that. Most people don't love words these days. They screen, when we look at our phones, we're screening. We're not reading, we're looking for pictures and headlines and interactive buttons, etc. We're a completely different, you know, I'm in the late 50s and I do that. Goodness knows what it's like for a digital native, very different. So you need to make your website your um, center of gravity. Now, your best friend in this, Google. Google wants you to do well. Google is looking for the freshest, most relevant answer. That's all it is, that's all their algorithm is. Don't try and outrun their algorithm with SEO people that promise you a moon on a stick. You're not going to get there. Google is changing its hour algorithm twice a day as a minimum. And obviously they have big updates every now and again. They're just doing one at the moment. But they're just looking for the freshest, most relevant answer. So as long as you keep on working those dials and keeping clear as to who your customer is, guess what? Google just wants to, when we put in a query to Google, whoever that Lorraine is, it just wants to find the most fresh and relevant answer to Lorraine's query. If it's in video, that trumps a picture. If it's in uh, words, a picture trumps words. So it's, it's all a bit top trumps. Sorry to use that name. Anyway, moving on, the website, it's all about getting your basics in place. Now, there's a wonderful tool that I find better than Google's digital garage. If you wanna get good at web, go on to, it's a, I think it's only a 40 hour course, Google digital garage, and it puts people through the paces of how you should engineer your website so that it makes itself legible to Google. So look on that by all means, but a very fast buyer and cheap trick, a trade trick, is a thing called Silk Tied Nibbler. Silk Tied Nibbler is S-I-L-K-T-I-D, as in tied to push, you know, the tide going out, and nibbler as in what they bring buildings down with. Silk Tied Nibbler, Put your URL into that. And what I like about it is it comes up with a quick and dirty list of ooh, traffic lights. Red, this is wrong. Amber, ooh, you need to watch this, but you're getting into the green, blue and purple. You're in the, the clover. It tells you and you put kinetics through. You'll see we're not perfect. 
um, you'll put it through and it will then give you a detailed description under each one to say, actually, you could be doing this better. It's really helpful and it's free to people like you. So if you're not a web developer, sorry if that's people like you. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know who I'm talking to. But just to say that, that I think Silk Type Nibbler is the business owner's friend for having a quick check on why is this not happening? Why is that? And even our guys who we, we work with some pretty um, hot um uh, website developers hot as in they know what they're doing and um they are uh held to account by so well i don't know i'd say that oh actually well now we look into it and whatever so there are some issues where um silk tide nibbler might pick up on something it's erroneous but there's generally some merit in there as well okay and then it's all about consistency make sure your brand is consistently exp expressed whether it's on um, your door, your front door of your um, office, the door of your car, your business card, your um, sales literature, your website, but also your social media platforms. And that's a big job for us often that, well, I say a big job, um, it's only about an, a two hour job to make sure that the uh, social media bios, so what Twitter says about you on that little um, bit of text underneath your icon on Twitter. It's really important that that's consistent with the one that you say on Facebook and that that one is consistent with the one you say on LinkedIn or anything like that. So make sure all those DNA um, are aligned on your social media platforms. And you bring the whole lot together in a grand plan and your grand plan comprises measurable objectives, your DNA, your personas, messages, and content themes. From now on, I'd like you please to communicate in content themes. Have one a month, go on, push the boat out. Have one a month. So say for instance, if you're a coffee shop, focus on Colombia one month and their coffee, or you could do Kenya the next month or whatever. It's your business, you get to decide. It's wonderful, freedom of expression, which is what we all want, I'm sure. Look at content themes, Focus on that and do it well. And then you never know, you might have somebody looking for a Colombian coffee and they think, wow, I'm going to go to um, Karen. There we go, Karen, you've got a coffee shop now. Karen's coffee shop, and because she had a focus on Colombia the other day and I love the Arabica, uh, the, she did that a couple of months ago and it was loaded with Arabica beans. It was delicious. I'm off to get me coffee from her. Do you know what I mean? These are tiny things, but guess what? That's the difference between one degree where water is at 99 degrees and water and 100 degrees and it becomes steam and can drive iron in the form of a locomotive. So we're only halfway through. I hope you're all right. Does anybody need to go to the coffee or go for a loo break? Do you mind if I just power on like that steam train? <laughs> so there's, there's lots of ways you can um, communicate. I'm just giving you a smorgasbord of ideas here that are for free, as in just make them happen yourself. I'm happy to give them to you. So first off, content preparation. Why am I saying content preparation? So say Karen in your coffee shop, if it was about um, Columbia, we could have a little brainstorm here. If anybody's got any ideas, pipe up now. Karen's got a coffee shop and she's having a Colombian month. OK, in the sessions that we're going to have, that won't be allowed. You'll have to participate. Does somebody have any idea of Colombia? No? OK, so Colombia is in South America, yeah, and they do some of the best coffees in the world. She could have, say for instance, she could research Columbia. She could point it out on the map, couldn't she? On a sheet of A4 that she could give as a disposable for people, because obviously with COVID times in Karen's coffee shop, she could pass out the um, Colombian coffee, why some of these coffees are seen as uh, some of the best in the world, because I don't know, are they grown at high altitudes or, they're in particularly fertile uh, soils or the rains of the Amazons feed their roots up. I don't know, but she could do something like that, couldn't she? And then an editor might be going in for their flat white one day and they say, who's the proprietor here, please? Ooh. 
the waiter thinks we've got a problem customer here. I'm very impressed with your sheet of paper here talking about da da da. I was wondering, could I do a feature on you? Would that be all right? And you say, yes, absolutely. So he does an interview with Karen and she talks all about Colombian coffee. And actually there is a very big difference between a flat white made out of Italian coffee or Colombian coffee. And these are the notes that you could look for. And then all of a sudden she's got a steady queue outside because people say, I want to try an Italian and a Colombian so I can see the difference. Social media, how could she amplify that? Facebook, do you think she could do something? What about Facebook Live? She could broadcast Facebook Live and see, here's the editor's reaction to her doing a Colombian and him saying, or her saying, oh, wow, yes. It's, it's sort of a more alcoholic almost uh, aroma to the Colombian one. Oh my word, we have to be careful, don't we, with the terms that we use here. Versus the Italian one though, it's still lovely, but it's it's much sweeter. And I think I prefer this other one. Let's taste them. And you could have that tasting, couldn't you, going on on Facebook um, Live. Instagram is good for that as well. But remember, with Instagram, it's more about pictures. You can get away with words on Facebook. It's more about pictures with Instagram. And LinkedIn is absolutely your friend if you're in the B2B space. So say if uh, Karen and her coffee shop was doing roasts for other coffee shops, the best place to link with them might be on LinkedIn, even though it's a very Facebook and Instagram driven um, marketplace. Now, if you're very clever at what you do, like Karen and her coffee, you might want to have a round table. This is where not only you who would head the table and sort of um, orchestrate the discussion, but you could get a few eminent friends, business friends, people that you know, that you really know, like and trust them. And you could get them around the table talking about themes of the day. Now, say, for instance, if you're a medic and you've come up with a way to treat COVID-19, they'll be have had a few of these roundtables, I'm sure. And out of that roundtable, insights would come as to, well, we know that we shouldn't stick people on ventilators too soon. We know that this dextromextrolone or whatever that drug is, um, is a cheap drug and it does help them through a particularly painful period for a couple of weeks. And then those insights would be going into what we call a white paper. A white paper comes from government lingo before it goes into a green paper before it becomes enacted as legislation. A white paper is feeding the government's thinking and that's exactly the sort of position you should be thinking of. Consider yourself as feeding the government's thinking regards what they should be thinking on, say, treatment of COVID-19. That's called a round table and a white paper combination. It's perhaps the ultimate at the moment for B2B brands to build authority, second only to being, say, like an Anthony Fauci, where you're seen as the world spokesperson on the subject. Crisis and issue management. If you like Karen and her coffee shop, you could probably very easily consider what crises could befall your business. Terrorist attack, poisoning, crack cup, somebody gets scolded in there, baby gets tipped over in a high chair. You should have thought through each one of these scenarios before you open. Because this is how Sully Sullenberger, who brought the plane down on the Hudson River when he left LaGuardia Airport and hit birds, that's how Sully Sullenberger kept his cool. He was not just a Navy pilot, he was a test pilot and a safety crash investigator. And he knew the power of drill. He knew the power of having a list of things that you check, 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 check. You know, it's a brilliant film if you want to see how to avoid crisis and how he ended up going for the Hudson. But you see how that, that the power of that working. Have a crisis plan in place. Know who you would call your health and safety inspector, your legal counsel, your accountant, your security guys, your IT people. Have those numbers in one place on your phone that you can get to them quickly. Speed is everything, as Jacinda Ardern has shown with her handling of the COVID um, crisis in um, New Zealand. Website and SEO. Make sure your website is tickety-boo. Hygiene, check it with Silk Tide Nibbler if you would. Talk to some web guys. Say you're interested in changing your web. Go and get three or four ideas and see which one you think really speaks 
um, the most common um, sense and put it through as many free tests, SEM, RUSH, S-E-M, S for sugar, E for Edward, M for mother, or even search engine marketing, um, RUSH, they're, they're good as well for checking this sort of um, thing out too. There's lots of other engines out there, I've just given you a couple. And then the Zenith on B2B marketing that we help people with is um, inbound marketing campaigns. When you're reaching out to a specific persona, you want to do content that really grabs them through the heart. You suck them into your narrative because they think, wow, yeah, she really gets me. She really understands what I'm trying to do and say here. When they come onto your website, you don't want them to go onto your About Us page because your About Us page is sanitized for everybody. It has to be able to be everything to all your personas. Now, remember, we're not going to be right from one extreme to another of the population. We're going to know our niche. But even within that niche, it's your About Us page has got to fit all the personas in that niche. With an inbound marketing campaign, you have a specialist landing page that they are driven into from wherever your content has got them. So that content may be the byline feature in an editorial. Remember, they are more powerful than normal websites in their backlinks. Not all backlinks were created equal. You may be from social media. It may be from another website or manner of places that they could come into. But when it pertains to that particular persona on an inbound marketing specialist campaign, you get them to come into a particular landing page and that landing page navigates them to all the relevant bits in your website. So that landing page says, these are the case studies you wanna see. These are the testimonials. These are the articles that we've written that are relevant to you. And if you're interested in going off our site into our social media, other people that we partner with, these are the people. So there's just six of the best ideas to get your brand cooking on gas. And then lastly, I'd like to uh, finish off with how to make the most of happy customers using Kinetic as an example, but also the um, dials. And then we're, we're all done and open for questions. So at the start of COVID, I'm part of a BNI group. If you don't know about BNI, let me um, tell you more about it because it's a great way to build business. And we meet on Thursday morning at quarter to seven. Yes, quarter to seven, that is a time in the morning. Anyway, and uh, it's brought me into the auspices of Chris Conley. Chris Conley is third generation um, wine importer and he uh, ran Birmingham uh, Conley's Fine uh, Wines. And he has done so well during COVID. He was a wine importer that had um, a little wine bar called, um, I just put my laser pointer on, um, Arch 13 down here and obviously the business has been swept from under that but did Chris lay down and die? No he didn't because he had some sort of uh, web presence already so he made his own look um, to a certain extent but then he also went out there and sold his wares to people in lockdown, the first lockdown that look, when you're going to the shop, there's a limit to how much you can pull out. Let me take the wine off you. I'll bring it round to your door. I'm still working. I'm still allowed to do so. I'll bring the wine to your door. And obviously we click and collect. We were limited to uh, 85 items with Tesco. So he has pivoted that business now that he's now running like a Sunday Times uh, wine club and uh, Lathwaite, some virgin wines, um, et cetera. He's doing very well out of that, very, um, very well, thank you. And he's trading more now than he did uh, before COVID. So that's one success story of a, um, a B2C um, side of things. Um, on our website, you can find this guy. This is uh, Will Kirkman. Yes, Santa. Santa uh, to us because he brings us gifts all year round. Will is so chuffed with what we do for him because he runs a company called Eco Merchant. Now, he came to us with a radical new product. Now, bearing in mind it's Eco Merchant, I don't like to think what's in this product, but it airtights buildings. It makes them airtight. It's a paint on airtight membrane. 
And if you're building a very environmentally friendly house that isn't going to leak heat, it's called a passive house, you need to make it airtight. And he said, do you think you could get this out to everybody in the building trade? No problem, Will, off we go. About two months into the campaign, he rang me up and he said, um, how many inquiries do you think you're going to get from this campaign? And I said, oh, I don't know how many, it's, it's very variable, but I'd be disappointed if it were fewer than 100, Will. He said, 2,000's out the ballpark then. I said, yes, that is remarkable. 2,000? You've got 2,000 reader inquiries. At the end of the campaign, he got 4,000. And the reason why he got 4,000 was this was a new product. It was very innovative and also a lot more builders are struggling. They can put concrete walls in and whatever, but they're struggling to those little gaps where the wall meets the um, ceiling or the floor to fill those in around window gaps, etc. And this product was absolutely um, bulletproof for, for making that happen. Anyway, I said to him at the start of the campaign, we guarantee our results. Uh, well, we can't guarantee sales, but we'll certainly guarantee um, the number of pieces of editorial coverage that you'll get. But so I can calibrate the budget accordingly before I um, come to you with the budget. How many pallets of this stuff do we need to shift to make this worthwhile? And he said 12, I thought, blimey, well, okay, that's quite a few pallets. <laughs> anyway, they all went, thank goodness. Because, um, but forget that, because he ignited an interest, but because also um, he, um, what was I going to say about the 12 pallets? Yes, because um, he knew that those 4,000 people on his database, because they were all GDPR compatible, that's something I haven't mentioned yet, but you need to make sure that your CRM databases, they do opt in, that they do want to get your emails. Anyway, he knew that that was worth a lot for his um, company, not just for blow proof sales, but also he's cross selling them since. Anyway, he says that it was absolutely stunning him that he couldn't believe 4000 leads. It's not the whole story, but it's a vital part. And if you want to ring him up, he'd be happy to take your call. Um, how measurable these things are, because obviously we all can see 4,000 leads um, coming in. Sometimes it's not as obvious. So uh, fire shield systems. I was at an exhibition and went up to this guy and he was busy. He's a very busy stand, but I knew what he did. And we had for um, a back chair international and other fire brands, so to speak. And uh, I said, if ever you're in the market for PR, here's my card. I'd love to chat to you. And he said, stay. I said, no, I can see you're here to sell, not to be sold to. I just I just want to get onto your radar, please. He said, please stay. I've got a bad back. Anyway, so I sat down with him for 20 minutes and he said, in, on reflection, meeting you, Kinetic, was the best thing that happened to RWM last year. He said, because RWM was good. They got lots of leads from it. But, you know, it's a one hit wonder and it takes a lot of time and a lot of um intensive work to get your stand up and running or whatever whereas what we're delivering him is that regular systematic flow of um, sales leads and what we've done with them is working in conjunction with his seo website people we have identified what are the key search terms on google search console if you want to know what your keywords are or Google Trends to see um, how trends are moving up and down in word use. Um, and we wanted uh, to see what those key search terms were for Fire Shield systems. We popped those terms into our copy, got them published, and it's working an absolute treat. His dials are all moving rather nicely because he has got case studies going out galore, which have been shortlisted for the UK Content Awards. And if you're not familiar with this, you need to be. This is Google Analytics screens, and it's called Customer. If you go into Google Analytics, um, to get readouts on your Google Analytics, you need to launch in with Google code to go on each page of your website. And then each page of your website will report to you how much people are staying on there, whether they're a unique visitor, etc. So all you need to know from this little mountain range ahead of you is the little mountain range with the orange line, that was last year, the blue mountain range since we've been on board is this year. And let me tell you his story. At the start of COVID, he was one of the people that said, I know I owe you, Ange. I know we're mid-contract, but I need to stop. He's a decent business. 
he was saying, I, I can't deal with this. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. It's an absolute fog. And we said, we'll wait. We'll wait for you to suspend us and we'll know when you're ready to come back on board. Anyway, every week we used to get a phone call from him. Lovely guy. His name's James Mountain. We've won another contract. Brill? During lockdown. That's great. Don't like to tell you about the next contract we might be getting, Ange. Why not? It's so big, it could be the biggest one. Oh, okay. Wait to hear. Sure enough, about four weeks later, we've landed it. The big one. Yes, I told you we didn't like to talk about things until we've got them. And what he can see from this traffic coming in is that you can see the volume of visitors is going up, which is what that blue line on the top is showing. But he can also see the quality of those visitors is going up. And how can he see that in this deceptively simple? Look at that, naught to three. It's tiny. But each one of those three queries that have either signed up for his newsletter or said get in touch via the website are worth thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds. So he's well happy. But forget that. This is the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of people are ringing the number and saying, we'd like to have a quote from you, please. Or could you come and consider our fire shield suppression systems needs? And he can see that people are staying longer. They're reading more. And as such, they're more convinced that fire shield systems is the way to go. All their dials are going up year on year. Their traffic is up over two and a half times. Another one like that is a back chair. We started working with a VAC chair back in um, 20, or oh, it doesn't matter, four years ago, four years ago. And they were a tiny manufacturing outlet in um, Tisley, the back of Birmingham. And they'd used PR consultancies before, but they'd just been doing half a pound of PR. They'd just been getting their name out there, saying effectively, a VAC chair does evacuation chairs. We came in and gave them their DNA as to what made them stand out. And the outcome is that they could see from their Google Analytics. Again, this is on our website. This video is on our website. I won't uh, play it to you now, but they could see the traffic coming in. Although it wasn't massively high, it was high quality and that you can check the lead. You can see on Google Analytics where it's coming from and you can see how long they dwell on the, your website, which pages they're particularly engaged with, and then most importantly of all, how much they convert, how many of them sign up to the newsletter, or how many of them sign up to having a call, or actually in a back chair's case, buying a chair off the web. So there's a very clear pattern through the website for them, but then they had to have different landing pages, which we helped them develop. So, for instance, they were selling to facilities managers in banking. But let's have one for banks. Let's have one for sports stadia. Let's have one for schools. There's all manner of different trade sectors that you can go to. That's one way in which you can segment your landing pages with eco merchant. We're segmenting them in a completely different way from a problem point of view. What's my problem? It's rising damp or a leaky roof or something. You can segment your market and your landing pages and personas in that way. But this is to prove to you the power of the case study. So if I tell you that you need to set out a case study, you'd probably write a story. Don't make it too blocky. Make it inviting to read in little blocks. So not like a wall of words that you've got to plow through, because although you and I may be quite comfortable with a wall of words, you need to go through the challenge, the solution, and what was the outcome as a result. And if you can end up on that, which is a video talking about this is how content fuels our Google Analytics, you get the most convincing. And I'll show you that if we haven't got time, uh, if we've got some time left over, I'll show you that at the end of um, this. OK, but there's there's lots of other case studies um, I could um, share with you of people who are really motoring as a result of COVID. I just want you to know that for all that these companies, I'm showing you results that have come over the majority of this year. 
Will has been building the Eco Merchant website for many years. Connolly's didn't take it seriously until COVID, but because he had the contacts at BNI, they could quickly ramp him up and switch him, pivot him into um, being an online um, business. FSS, he relies on face-to-face -face communication because it's a very high trust consultancy, but to get those leads in the first place, he needs to educate the people that when you have a battery fire, say on a car, it's a very different fire, obviously, to and needs a very different fire suppression system to say a normal diesel um, engine. And a VAC chair, they've done so great that they're taking their marketing in-house because we've got them out of that small um, business into a medium mentality. Okay, wrapping up over the next few slides, let's talk about how do you measure? How do you measure all this work that's um, being done? These are the dials that I suggest you should um, look at. So. First of all, the one in the front and center is Google Analytics. And the one I would go for is audience acquisition. Where are you getting your visitors from? Where are they coming from? You can click on organic and you can see all the different feeds that feed into that. You can see how long they've been on your website. You can see your bounce rate, your bounce rate is how quickly they come onto your first page and come up. If that's the only page they come onto and then they bounce off, you got it wrong, basically. You want them to be suitably intrigued to explore the rest of your website, all right? Going from the left, sales has got to be the critical one, hasn't it? Are you selling or not? And there are what we call leading indicators into those sales. So any salesman will tell you, I don't look for the number of sales I've got. I'm looking at the number of sales inquiries or sales proposals I've got out there or how quickly those leads are converting into prospects because that tells me what the appetite is out there in the uh, market for my services. And then your CRM system should be judging all of that in terms of your number of GDPR prospects. You want to see that number growing. Some will be unsubscribing as you go because they'll say, no, I thought you were for me, but actually you're not. That's okay. We want a database of people who are for us. We want um, a building crew, not a wrecking crew. And your emailer open rates as well. You want people who are going to open your emails on a regular basis. And, you know, some people are getting really low rates, 4%, and they're happy with that because it, it justifies its uh, return on the investment. Um, social media, don't just look for the vanity metrics of um, how many followers you have. Look for engagements. How deep are you getting into engagement with your, um, your followings? And lastly, editorial for your reach, relevance and audience. How many publications, online publications, more often than not, are you reaching? And what do they say um, about you? OK, and I'd like you to leave you with... Ah, oh, we love Bill in the PR industry. Bill Gates said, if I was down to my last dollar, I'd spend it on PR. But he also said content is king. And he said the content creators are who are going to win from this. And if you're brilliant at creating content, you're going to win in the, the, the infinite game that is business.